Either start, but with a little recap. What you have in front of you are parallel texts of the resurrection stories from the four Gospels. You have them in the new Revised Standard Version. And what I've asked you to do is look for words or phrases that are similar between various texts. You have it in the New Revised Standard Version because it and the Revised Standard Version are the closest translations to the Greek that we have. Many modern translations try to uh, express a phrase as opposed to translating almost word for word. And there's nothing wrong with trying to express a phrase because sometimes the meaning becomes clearer. But for this little exercise I wanted to push us all the way back to texts that would be somewhat close to the original Greek. So, what things did you find as you looked through the text. And there, there aren't wrong answers, so don't sit there and be shy. It was the first day of the week. It was the first day of the week. It was early morning, it's still dark. Okay, now let's back up. Did everybody say it was the first day of the week? Mark has Sabbath. When the Sabbath was over. Aha. Uh -huh. On the first day. Right. Because the first day of the week was gone. Right. Quite the first day of the week. So everybody was in agreement that it was the first day of the week. Okay? What other things did you find? Um two of them it says they brought spices. Uh, but some of the, the stone, they, they, the two women were wor worried about who's going to remove the stone. And in each story, the stone is removed somehow, though in each story is something different. Okay. Good observation. Stone is gone, but everybody didn't agree on how or who <coughs> removed the stone. What else did you find? Yeah, Sandy. Um, Matthew has his appearance was like lightning, clothing white as snow. Mark has a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right. Luke has two men in dazzling clothes. John just says that Simon Peter saw the living wrappings. Well, if you, if you get further down into John, after Simon Peter shows up, Mary is standing outside the tomb, and again, the two angels in white are sitting where the body of Jesus had done. So, and it's still there, it's just later in the story than in John. Okay. As often happens in John, John takes a little longer sometimes to explain the same thing that everybody else said more succinctly. Well, which is kind of funny, because at the very beginning, it seemed like he was being more succinct, and then all of a sudden, Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. What else did you learn? Uh, well, I found it kind of interesting that in Matthew and Mark there was only one young man, but in Luke and John there were two. Mm -hmm. um, also in John, and of course I didn't get down that far in the other three, Jesus shows up. Mm -hmm. The women go in that. You didn't the women, yep. the women are the ones that go first. Mm -hmm. It doesn't specifically say that initially in Luke, but then it was inferred in the other translation. It does say the women. Well, it, it, the others say the women, but in Luke, um, and see, this is the difficulty with the English translations. If you notice at the beginning of the Lucan passage, they came to the tomb, but the they in Greek is feminine. Okay. 
meaning that it was women who came. So Luke has it there. Okay. All right. So it's um, Greek is a gendered grammar specific mm -hmm. language where they have a different version. There's a different ending. You can have they, which is masculine. You can have they, which is feminine. Okay, and this again, this becomes important in translation because sometimes you all know I'm not a raving feminist. Okay, but sometimes when you read a text, especially in the King James or in the RSV, and it says the men this and the men that. Well, the word that is often there in Greek is anthropos, which means men or it means people. And you have to read through, you have to look at the entire text to begin to get an idea of what it might be. There is a Greek word that is specific to the male species. But anthropos can go either way. So when you're studying in Greek, you have to look for these kinds of things. But when we translate into English, okay, we're trying to get the story told. And sometimes we do things like, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb. Now, Luke makes it clear later on that it was women. But in that opening verse, some people might question who. Question who. Sandy, you had your hand up. Um, it's almost the same in Matthew and Mark about he has been raised and going ahead into Galilee. Mm -hmm. um, Luke has, has risen. And John, he must rise from the dead. Good observations. In the end, what's the bottom line of all four yeah, phrases? He, he, He's up. He rose. <laughs> he rose. But Jesus only meets them in two of them, right? Yes. There's only two where he specifically speaks about meeting the disciples in Galilee. In Matthew, he, he sees both women. And in John, he only sees... I'm going to suppose Mary Magdalene. Yeah, well, in verse 11, it says Mary. Well, how many Marys are in the Bible? But they'd already, he, John already established that Mary Magdalene was there in the first verse. Right, but it was Mary and the other Mary. Or no, not in John. Not in John? Not in John. Okay, in, oh, so in John, it's just Mary Magdalene. Right. Gotcha. Any other interesting things that you found? The responses are different. So, in, you know, whether they are going to actually go and tell everybody that Jesus is there, or whether, because we have, like, they, they ran in Matthew, you know, they ran quickly to tell the disciples. And then in Mark, um, they don't tell anyone. <laughs> and then in Luke, um, they don't believe it, so they don't tell they don't, they don't think it's it actually happened. Mm -hmm. um, it's only Peter who's like, oh, yeah. Um, and then John, they don't have a huge kind of reaction there, but they just go, like, oh, that's empty. That's it. Not even like, hey, you can raise. They're just like, it's empty. Well, actually, in John, <coughs> the very last verse, what does Mary Magdalene say? I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. All of this to, is to say, resurrection was not something that the followers of Jesus were looking for three days after the crucifixion. So we have four accounts of something that people weren't expecting. And while they may differ in some phrases, and while there may be some overlap in other phrases, something very profound has happened in first century Judaism, let alone in the followers of Jesus. Something very different. And how do you 
30 years, 40, 50 years later, how do you convey that to this band of followers that have, come, that have arisen in the various communities that have been established throughout the known world? How do you convey that? And that's what these guys are trying to do. They're in agreement that it was on the first day of the week. They're in agreement that he has been raised or he is risen. And that gets into tricky stuff about the Greek text that we don't need to worry about at the moment. They are in agreement that the tomb is empty. But where do we go from here? Now, remember, they're writing this down 30 years after this all happened. So something, this obviously had some impact on people. Because Paul goes, it, it writes letters about the impact of all of this. And those letters were written before these four guys ever even thought about putting the story of the actual resurrection into a text. So Paul's busy proclaiming Jesus as Lord to the Thessalonians, to the Ephesians, to the Philippians, to the Romans, to the Corinthians. But none of them have these texts. So why do you think the Gospel writers thought it was important to put this story into their text? It's one of the few stories that all four Gospels have. Why do you think in the 60s, 70s, and 80s they thought it was important to put this in? Because that's the, the <coughs> that holds the whole thing together. That's the, the, the crucifixion is what saved us. And but, they don't, but they don't tell them. They're not thinking of that yet. They're just mind blown that something happened. Right. Were they thinking? Okay, fair enough. But I mean, if that's if that's what they've come to believe over the thirty years as what the whole purpose of him dying was, wouldn't they need to make sure everybody knew that? Well, actually, no. That's not explaining. That's explaining Paul. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe because that was the amazing thing that happened that nobody could explain in. They wanted to try and limit how they wanted to limit the telephone game. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting way of putting it. Um, I would suggest to you that resurrection created a power that they had not seen. And as each gospel writer looked back on the life of Jesus, and what am I going to say? I think you're on to something that it was something of a linchpin. The crucifixion certainly was, but the resurrection was as much of a linchpin. And as they looked back on what am I going to say about Jesus? And there were lots of things for them to say. The crucifixion wasn't complete without this story of the resurrection. Let's look at this from another way. What do you notice, somebody said this earlier, but let's go back. What do you notice about Mark's resurrection story? Mark's How does it end? They didn't tell anybody. Jesus comes. They were afraid. They didn't tell anybody. Jesus, Jesus came. And he tells them um, <coughs> but then what, what did the people do? They didn't do anything. They, they fled. They were afraid. They fled in terror and amazement and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Now, bear in mind, that's the first version. The f yes? This is just going back to what you um, said about the whole <coughs> concept of, of the resurrection and um, the looking back on uh, how they looked at death, mm -hmm. it was, it, to me what this, the story was trying to say is that it was putting um, 
the whole life of, well, and a lot of people being crucified, they were being killed, and it looks like that, you know, God was supposedly here, you know, people were praying to God, there was a relationship with God during life, but at death, you know, it's like, I mean, you're just there, you know, it's not, not a, um, and it was changing the whole concept, the whole realm of life and death, you know, I mean, because mm -hmm. it wasn't something, it wasn't, turned it from this desolate, black, um, empty, lonely place, you know, where you don't even have a name anymore, you're just sort of a whole lot of nothing to uh, something where, um, you know, the, the, it was part of a whole, uh, was, they put it into the context, like his life was an example of the whole realm. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're living in the, not just life or death, it's, it's a Whole, there's a bigger realm. Yeah, there's a whole and God, realm. It's, it's all part of one thing. You know? And God is in control. God's in, every, God's in, in every part of it. Good point. The first person to try to write this just put out a bare bones they couldn't understand that. description. Perhaps because they're all still trying to figure it out. But then Roughly 10 years later, Matthew puts a little more flesh on it. And around the same time, Luke puts a little more flesh on it. And when Luke puts a little more flesh on it, bear in mind that Matthew and Luke are writing for two different audiences. Okay. But when Luke puts a little more flesh on it, he provides some details that we haven't seen. He tells us who, who all the women are. Although Mark starts with a list of women, Luke concludes with a list of women. Luke concludes with amazement. Interestingly enough, Matthew, Matthew's amazement doesn't come until the very end of the chapter, which of course isn't here. Matthew's amazement is when Jesus has actually gotten to Galilee and he stands up and he says, um, go, therefore go and baptize all nations, making disciples of all people, and lo, I am with you always until the end of the age. So amazement comes later in Matthew. No amazement in the original portion of the Markan text, amazement for Luke, and utter amazement in John. And the amazement in John is wrapped up in Mary Magdalene. Yeah, Dixie. I think that, that <clears throat> it's really amazing the fact that uh, these texts were written so long after the event, but yet they're all still um, in the same in the same vein, they they say a lot of the same things. If you try to remember what you did ten Th years ago, <laughs> twenty years ago, and remember it in detail, forget it. You know. Mm -hmm. So I I think that in itself <clears throat> makes it more true that these things happened because it was so far removed from it, and yet everybody more or less agreed that these are the things that happened. I think that the, uh, I think another thing that we have to keep in mind is resurrection is not something that human beings back then or now immediately wrap our heads around. It's a concept, it's a reality that you can study and study and study but until you experience it in some way, shape, or form, it doesn't mean anything. What I'm getting at is John may have been, John may be the beloved disciple, he may have been there when Jesus was crucified and was raised from the dead. Okay? It was close to 50 years later when he finally sat down to tell his story. 
One might ask why. Well, you can speculate all you want. I, I just want to suggest that John was profoundly changed by this and trying to figure it all out took him a long time. You might say to me, so why did Paul write all of his letters sooner than these guys wrote these Gospels? Paul's encounter with the risen Christ was very different what, than what these guys described in the Gospels. Right? Correct. Blinding moment. Damascus Road. These guys live with him. Or, or some of them probably were disciples of his, were there. Oh my God, what's going on? Paul? I, I, I got it. I, I got it, Lord. I'm good. I'm good. I'm ready to go. <laughs> we all have these different reactions, right? And resurrection, I think, is the, is the linchpin that changes everything. Now, don't get me wrong. Crucifixion is of major importance because it was on the cross where Jesus bore the sin of the world and the wrath of God. But without resurrection, what does crucifixion mean? He's just dead. Just he's, like all the other messiahs. he's just dead like every other messiah. And there were a lot of them who swore they were the Messiah. These stories make that death different. And because they make it different, it did take time for people to figure out, how do I tell this? And that same, still, same thing still happens today. Um, I'm, I've lost track of who it was. You, uh, no, I have, I'm, I'm conflating two stories. I've lost track of somebody who waited way late in life to write their autobiography, but I can tell you, Ulysses S. Grant, general of the, of the armies, won the war for Lincoln, president of the United States, even back in the 1870, late 1870s, people were, you know, you need to write your memoirs. You need to tell your story. You know, how did you do that? How did you defeat Lee? How did you manage to do all of that? Nah, he didn't have any interest in doing it. He finally wrote his autobiography, memoir, whatever you want to call it, and he finished the text the day before he died. Oh, jeez. You know what the impetus was? He had throat cancer. And he was destitute, and he needed to leave money for his wife. So he wrote his autobiography. Now, I'm not saying these guys were in that situation, but what I'm getting at is sometimes we have a story to tell, and it just takes us a while to get to the point where we can tell the story. Maybe these guys were encouraged by the communities that Paul had founded. They were popping up all over the place. Not just the communities that we discuss, that, that are named in the New Testament, but there were more of them, especially in, in um, uh, the area that we now call Turkey. I mean, if you read Revelation, think of all the towns that Revelation mentions. They're all in Turkey, what we now call Turkey. So communities were, were building up. And maybe these guys just got to a point where they said, we've got to tell the story. And each one told a story, and here it is. Yeah, Dix. If they hadn't, if they hadn't stopped at that point, maybe they had been telling the story mm -hmm. at that time, and they had <coughs> the realization that after they were gone, there would be no one to tell the story in their words because they were there. Right. You know, I mean, it's one thing for me to say, well, you know, Mark told me, blah, 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 but it was Mark that saw it, not me. And, uh, you know, there, there is the theory that Mark is the young man in Mark's gospel. In the Garden of Gethsemane, there is a one-liner. It's in uh, Mark, I think it's 1451. There's a one-liner, and it says, And a youth ran away naked 
from the Garden of Gethsemane. And the theory is that that was Mark. Um, there are other theories, and I'm going I may have this backwards, so Jackie, help me out, that Peter dictated his story to Matthew, or was it to Mark? Have you heard that one? There, there, is, there is a theory, not, nobody can prove it 2,000 years later, that um, Peter told his story to either Mark or Matthew. And that became, and I think it was Mark, but that became part of the foundation of Mark's gospel. So your, your point, yes, they were, they were getting older and they had a story to tell, or they knew people who had a story to tell, okay? Because Luke, we're sure, was, well, we know from the list of names that he wasn't one of the 12. We don't know for sure that he wasn't part of the, the extended group of disciples. But somehow or another, they still got so much alike in telling the story. You will not find that if you look at the birth narratives. Who tells the birth narratives? Matthew. That's one. Luke. Luke. That's two. Who are, who's the central character, who are the central characters in the Lucan version of the birth narrative? I'm really pushing you on this one, I know, because I'm not letting you get a Bible out. In the days of Caesar Augustus, when Quirinius was governor of Syria, all the world went to be enrolled, and? Okay, what, any other central characters in that story? Herod and... Ah, see, this is, this is where it gets interesting. Herod's not in Luke. Herod's not in Luke? Uh -uh. The shepherds are the other central characters. In Matthew, the central characters are Herod and the wise men. However, if you ask the average Christian on Christmas Eve, who came to see Jesus in the Luke story? They'll, oh, well, you know, Mary and Joseph and the babe were in the manger and the shepherds came and the wise men came. So nobody came in the Luke story? The shepherds. The shepherds, okay. I'm, what I'm getting at is there are greater differences in the way Luke and Matthew told the birth of Jesus than there are in the way the four guys told the crucifixion and the resurrection. That doesn't make the birth any less important. But it just gets interesting that these texts, and this, these resurrection texts in particular, were of such importance that somehow or another there was a collective story that everybody wanted to tell. There is no, enro there's no, uh, um, Caesar Augustus in the Matthew birth narrative. There's no Quirinius in the Matthew birth narrative. There's none of that stuff. And yet they both are telling the same story. Yeah, Sandy. Luke traveled with Paul. Luke did travel with Paul. So he got some information, you know, through the travels, <coughs> what Paul did. Paul wrote the letters. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. And then later, Luke wrote. That's a very good point. Luke, in case you didn't know it, Luke, in Luke's, in the, in the Acts of the Apostle, Luke talks about traveling with Paul. And there's an interesting little footnote. If you read, if you start with Paul's conversion, chapter 9, and you read forward in Luke for about uh, the next... 10 chapters or so. You will see that Luke, the author, shifts from third person to first person. We went to Traus. We went to, and, and we did this and we did that. Whereas it started by talking about Paul in the third person. He was on the road of Dama to, to Damascus. He did this, he did that. And it's just, it's just one of those little interesting narrative twists. It's not big, it will not affect your faith, 
but it's just one of those things that is a reminder that Luke was with Paul on those travels. Okay? Yeah, Janet. These four gospel writers experienced Jesus from the time he began his ministry through the, the ascension. How would they know about his birth? How would they have known the they, details of his birth? They might have talked to Mary herself. Because um, I, I know, I'm presuming from time to time that she was with them based on some of the stuff we learned about Mary Magdalene. Um, and um, it, some of the, the wedding, they were there, Mary was there saying, Jesus, do this. So, and then there was another place where Jesus' family went to go get him. So his family was around, it just isn't necessarily spoken. There was hints that they were there, but they're just not necessarily. Who so would have been paying attention to the birth <coughs> until you knew that it was right. something? Because it's like, if you ask your mom and my dad what my birth was like, you know, it's like you get a different story. No. The, the birth narratives are believed to be later additions to the texts. Now part of that thinking arises from the fact that Mark doesn't have a birth narrative. And Mark was the first gospel. The gospel of Mark begins, this is the gospel of Jesus the Son of God, or some language that I, I've butchered that, but it begins this is the, the, the gospel of Jesus, of Nazareth I think is what it says okay no birth he's just there yeah, Marta everybody's born you know I mean that's part of being a human being we all are, we all are born and probably the witnesses to it uh, you know nobody <coughs> It was the shepherds or the wise men, you know, the, there was no story written, but the, with the resurrection, something that this was the first, and there, were, there was probably, at the time that it happened, there was a lot of shame and guilt on the part of uh, the different apostles or the people who didn't stand up, you know, the denials or the, the I mean, uh, like it's reflected in Mark, the fear, you know, I mean, that, that is probably how people reacted, you know, uh-oh. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but probably, I know that I um, studied history, and one of the big things when you're looking at um, like historical accuracy is um, on whether you're creating a, a, a valid document that accurately, accurately reflects history is that the first person accounts are what they're the gold standard. That's what you go back to. Mm -hmm. And I probably they realized, even though they weren't like looking at it in that those that. Um, mindset that the first person account is what comes. That's and that's what you have yeah. in these resurrection stories. Um, I, I would also suggest that because the theory is that the birth narratives were later additions, that at some point in the first century, late part of the first century, as these Gospels were either being written or were beginning to circulate, the issue would have arisen in some of these communities. Well, where did this guy come from? This is all great. Where did he come from? And two guys, Luke and Matthew, felt the need to describe a birth in some way. John describes it metaphorically. So, Christine. what if uh, in that time they're going, well, how, how is this Jesus guy, is, how is he actually the person who is supposed to be the Messiah? What, how, how, can you trace his line now? Maybe it was a way to prove he's actually of the Davidic line and that he's actually... But bear in mind, bear in mind, that proof was offered apart from the birth narratives. This, uh, that's true. Well, actually, let me, let me correct myself. In Matthew... Proving that he is part of the Davidic line is the opening 
of the Gospel of Matthew, which it's the first 17 verses of chapter 1, and then in verse 18, Matthew writes, and this is the story of the birth of Jesus. And then he tells about the angel coming to Joseph and Mary being pregnant and Joseph not divorcing her. In Luke's Gospel, the first chapter starts with the Annunciation to Zechariah and Elizabeth that they will have a son in their old age, the Annunciation to Mary that she will bear the Son of God, the whole story of Mary and Elizabeth and the birth of John the Baptist, second chapter is the whole birth of Jesus. It's not until the third chapter of Luke that Luke begins the process of establishing the lineage of Jesus. Does it really matter where the lineage comes with the rapture story? I want to suggest that all of that preamble stuff, for lack of a better phrase, is a hint that its purpose in being there is not the same as these texts. The pre, the, that preamble stuff is there to answer an assortment of questions. Small piece of trivia, has nothing to do with the resurrection. Uh, Matthew's genealogy in chapter 1 goes back to Abraham. Now the, the age-old story is Matthew was writing for a Jewish audience. Luke's genealogy in chapter 3 goes back to Adam. And the story is that he was writing for a Gentile audience. Why would you have that difference? Well, wouldn't the Jews already know that um, that's the whole son of man connotation from Adam, whereas the Gentiles might not? That's, that's, one, that's one way of looking at it. Another thought is by pushing Jesus all the way back to the very first human being. It's Luke's way of saying, you're all part of the story. Oh. Whereas Matthew was not as concerned with highlighting to Gentiles that you are as much a part of the story as the Jews, but Luke was. And so Luke pushes it back, which probably also reflects what you were saying a minute ago about Luke's travels with Paul. He's been to these Gentile situations. He's seen Paul preach He's probably also Jesus. Questions that these Gentiles He's have. probably heard them all. And so in his gospel, pushing it all the way back to the first human being becomes more important. Well, yes? There are also historians that believe that Luke himself is a Gentile. Yes. That have, right. That he came, and this is, Jesus isn't just for isn't just for, didn't just come to, to the people of Israel. But came to the people of Israel first, came to the Gentiles. When the people of Israel left him, didn't listen, he went on. One more question, and then I got to go. You were going to say something. If it goes back to Adam, it's Mary, Jew. Because if the Holy Spirit did it and not Joseph, what difference does it make? But that's, um, bear in mind, Luke may have been a Gentile, but Luke had a foot in each camp. So when you read Luke's gospel, don't always read it as only being about the Gentiles. He knew enough about the Jews to know that there, there was the belief well, not the belief, it was promised in 2 Samuel 7 that, that the Messiah will come up out of your line, David. These guys weren't stupid. They may have been Galileans and rough, but they weren't stupid. Anyway, you have the old boy back next Sunday. <laughs>